Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Crosscheck Live, which is another opportunity for us to continue the conversation we've been having all day. My name is Devin Carbato. I am a professor of law here at UCLA and the associate vice chancellor for Bruin X, the research and development arm of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. As some of you might know, in addition to our research institutional design and diversity training, part of what we do in Bruin X is put on programming that's intended to engage intellectually complex, normatively fraught, and politically difficult ideas, themes, and issues <coughs> that at their core force us to grapple with and articulate exactly what we might mean by equity, diversity, and inclusion for all. We want to make absolutely clear at the same time that it's critical that the voice of the university connect to the life of the city, the life of the state, the life of the nation, and indeed the life of the world. To put all of this another way, we believe that as a university we are carriers and producers of knowledge, and part of carrying and producing that knowledge means that we ought to engage multiple dimensions of social life, including social upheaval, including social up unrest, and including moments of violence. It's those commitments that suggested to us that we absolutely had to mark the 25th anniversary of the Rodney King verdict. And I chose my words carefully here. I did not say the LA riots. I did not say the LA rebellions. I did not say Saigu. I did not say the civil unrest. Um, what you might not know is that some of the programming that we put on in Bruin X has engendered controversy around the naming. I'll give you an example. The last session we did, you might remember, Jerry, was uh, entitled Trumping Democracy? Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> so we got comments ideologically inflected from the left that said, how could you possibly have a question mark around trumping democracy? Of course Donald Trump is trumping democracy. We got comments from the right asking, how could you possibly have a question mark around trumping democracy? Of course Donald Trump isn't. All of this is to say we recognize that we're entering an ideological minefield, which is precisely why we are, as it were, in it. Thus, we know that this is a moment that might raise controversial questions, but that is why we think we are to be here. Not because we want you to feel hurt, but because we fundamentally believe that it's critical for the university to take on some of the most pressing matters of our time. So in a moment, I'm going to shut up and turn things over to uh, my colleague and boss, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Jerry Kong. But I want to offer just a few autobiographical notes um, before I do so. Note one, I was a first year law student at Harvard Law School during the aftermath of Rodney King. Note two, prior to going to law school, I was an undergraduate student at UCLA and lived in the inner city, specifically on Harlington and 23rd. UCLA at that time was pre-209, which is to say it was incredibly, incredibly, one more time, incredibly diverse. Note three, at the time at Harvard Law School, I was studying criminal law, and in that context, it seemed that my professor was doing absolutely everything he could to take questions of race and racial justice and criminal justice off the table in a course that was about criminal law. Note four, I decided at that moment that it was critical for African Americans in particular to occupy spaces of knowledge in law schools to change that frame. Note five, that project brought me back to UCLA, where part of my work is to teach constitutional law, is to teach anti-discrimination law, is to teach immigration law, is to teach about fundamental issues of equity, diversity, and criminal justice. Note six, and this is where I'll end, coming back here also in many ways has brought me to the intersection of Saigu and the LA rising, uprising in the sense that I live and have been living in Koreatown for over 15 years. It's a place I call home. Uh, so thank you very much for indulging that preface. Let me now turn it over to Vice Chancellor Kang. Thank you. 
<laughs> so many of you have been, here, have been here, some of you the entire day. It's been a long haul. I, I promise you this will be a really interesting conversation in part because of the ground rules that I will actually lay out. I am Jerry Kong. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I am deeply grateful that you are here, that this enormous, think about the density of talent and experience just on this, uh, on this stage uh, to have this conversation with us. Uh, I will not give you six points that are autobiographical. I will tell you that, uh, note one, that I was a second year law student while I think this man was a first year law student at Harvard Law School. And I also profoundly remember that moment in 1992. And if you were here in the morning, I said, when I saw those images on a small black and white television, um, you know, in the lounge of the, you know, the law review editor's room, and I saw what was going on, the slow moving train wreck, <laughs> the pain that came over all of us, the feeling that you could not do anything. And again, repeatedly, the understanding that there but for the grace of God go I, because I too am an immigrant, my parents didn't have any education, they would have been doing the exact same thing if they were in LA. That made me reaffirm my commitments to do social justice work and racial justice work in law. And it is why this partnership that I have with uh, Devin Carbato, why what we're doing in the Office in Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, uh, to try to build equity for all, but always to do it in a way that is intellectually honest, rigorous, and holding ourselves accountable to our professed ideals, that's the challenge. One of the signature ways we do this is to have these really hard conversations that we brand as cross-check live. And here are the ground rules. One, no speeches. And I, we have really significant people here, including elected council members, so it's hard for me to say no speeches, but we mean, in some sense, no speeches. Number two, there will be hard questions, and I and <laughs> Professor Carbato will <laughs> A good sense of humor. I like that this is humor. Uh, we'll ask hard questions and we'll interrupt. And third, the only other thing that I want people to remember, I, I realize that people, are, it is being filmed, it is being live streamed, uh, it will be recorded, uh, uh, but that I ask everyone to be brave. In too many of these engagements, there is a requirement that we perform a certain kind of getting along that is ultimately insipid and banal. And what that kind of banal engagement does is allows us to paper over real differences that then allow us to go home and recognize that nothing of significance was actually discussed and that we just papered over differences that continue to fester. And we're in a moment where, again, especially at a great public research university, we need honest engagement. So I want you to be brave. I'm asking you to be brave. I will try as well. Uh, with that, all that I want to do is to read quickly just the taglines of your bios. The bios are all here. I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. Susan, and raise your hand when I call out your name. Susan Burton, who's the executive director of A New Way of Life and founder of All of Us or None. Uh, she has done a lot of great work in collaboration with UCLA Law School. Yep. Council member Marquise Harris Dawson who has to uh, uh, exit a little bit early, uh, but it won't be because of anything I say. Third, Lisa Hasegawa, activist in residence fellow at UCLA and former executive director of the uh, uh, National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development. Uh, fourth, Darnell Hunt, uh, professor of sociology, director of the Bunch Center for African American Studies here at UCLA. Mark Anthony Johnson, number five, who is the director of health and wellness and interim campaigns director for Dignity and Power Now. Number six, Do Kim, a civil rights lawyer and president of the K.W. Lee Center for Leadership. Number seven, Esther Lee, co-founder and former vice chair of Council of Korean Americans, among many other things. Number eight, uh, council member David Ryu, uh, council district four, uh, long, long time uh, advocate for UCLA with deep connections in all kinds of ways. Uh, first Korean American ever to be elected to the council. Uh, number nine, Marquez Vestal. Graduate student in UCLA Department of History, number 10, Eric Watt, author of many interesting uh, <laughs> works, including The Making of a Gay Asian Community and Oral History of the Pre-AIDS Los Angeles. And you've already met Saul Sarabia, who has a long connection, who's a community activist and organizer, and has had a long connection, especially with UCLA and the critical race studies uh, concentration. That's it with bios. I'm gonna hand it back over to Devin, who will give you an outline of the three acts that will unfold. So we'll just start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start with Act One, uh, going back in time to 1992. And I think what I want to do is ask the Marvin Gaye question, which is to say, what's going on in 1992? We might begin by noting with respect to technology, there's no Instagram, there's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, there's no Vining, there's no Snapchat, 
and we survived. We might also mark that this is a moment in which Whitney Houston is saying, I will always love you. Uh, Michael Jackson <laughs> is saying, it doesn't matter if you're black or white. And do you remember, too legit, too legit to quit, uh, ain't too proud to beg. So this is all a part of the scene. What's also part of the scene is George Bush is president, Pete Wilson is governor, Tom Bradley is mayor, Daryl Gates is chief of police, Daryl Gates is chief of police, Daryl Gates is chief of police, uh, mass incarceration, which is to say the new Jim Crow is in full swing, and LA is burning. So what I think I want to ask as a point of departure, and I would start with respect to um, Darnell, um, tell us what we would be seeing on television, what we would be hearing on the radio, and what we would be um, reading in the newspaper. You are an expert in media studies. How was this being framed? Well, a lot of it uh, depends on which day we're talking about, because the coverage sort of evolved over time. Um, the media, um, they are driven by routines that sort of dictate the way they cover the news. And the biggest routine that I think shaped coverage of these events was the breaking news format. That is to say, you know, there's a fire over there, people are looting over here, I'm, I'm going to, you know, jump over to so-and-so, as opposed to stepping back and trying to digest exactly what's happening. So what that meant is that there were precious few interviews of people who were actually participating, which might give viewers at home a sense of why people were doing what they were doing. And this, I think, was more or less um, conditioned by, I guess, a habit of, of news coverage going back to the 1960s. In fact, with the Kerner Commission report in 1968, there were a number of journalism institutes that were you know, put together to try to help the news media figure out how to cover these events so as not to incite further violence. That was the goal. So there was a law and order frame that sort of shaped everything in terms of what the purpose of the news media were. And in this whole process, there was really no space to understand why people were doing what they were doing. So um, essentially what you get is you get a bunch of assumptions about people participating because of this herd mentality. Um, there's no thought um, that couldn't possibly be political motivation. So the events are riots. They're not a rebellion, they're not a revolt, or they're not all of these other things that um, they could be. Now, one of the things that we eventually discover, of course, is that it was a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-class, multi-gender, very diverse event. People were participating for a range of different reasons. Um, it was triggered by verdicts, but of course, underneath the surface, there were all kinds of structural and other issues that had festered for years that when the verdicts were read, sort of ignited you know, frustration, anger, and created a platform for people to uh, engage with that particular moment in history. So the media don't get it right at all the first, first few days. You just see fires, you see looting, uh, you see people who have no idea why this is going on. Uh, they're jumping from one place to the next. And I should add that the media were quite monolithic ethnically and racially during that period. There wasn't a lot of diversity. In fact, there still isn't. I mean, today, about 12% of newsrooms are people of color. Back then, the numbers were a lot worse. LA Times didn't have reporters of the color that sent to these areas and often didn't know what was going on. And now, some of you may recall that shortly after the uprisings, they created neighborhood newspapers mm -hmm. to try to make up for lost ground in terms of what they hadn't done in the past. So there was precious little understanding of what was happening. So precious little understanding of what was happening, including an overdetermination of the law and order frame. So I want you to answer a question that I know persists in people's minds as they think about this particular episode today. Is it fair to say that rioting played no role? Or does whatever narrative we offer have to include the claim that rioting was in fact, is in fact a part of that story? So your understanding of the event, is it one that says rioting is not a part of the narrative? Or is it instead an account that says writing is part of a broader narrative? How do you respond to the writing frame? I think my response would be that absolutely there are people who um, had no political content behind why they might have walked into a store and taken things that they knew belonged to somebody else. I'm thinking about two conversations. One, I want to get a haircut for this event on Monday. And the guy who owns my haircut uh, place overheard me talking to somebody about the event. And he said, you know, uh, I overheard your conversation. I was 18 years old, and I just have to tell you, I went in and did some shopping. 
And I had no sense of it being any kind of political expression. And there is a lot of youngsters who just being, were being foolish. Um, I had a conversation with my sister-in-law, who grew up not too far from Slauson and Western, and asked her, she was 17 when she was living through this, um, and she described um, feeling in the very first moments like her life was at risk, and the next day, uh, in her words, grabbing trash bags and joining everyone else to take stuff. I think that recognizing that as a feature of what we would call writing instead of a politically informed um, action or rebellion has to be coupled with our assertion that when there is social upheaval that is produced by uh, inequality, that is produced by people not feeling ownership in their own neighborhoods, by people not feeling, feeling valued by the broader society, it does not have to have a rhyme and reason that rolls out in this way and that these elements are part of social upheaval because I know that if I had been door knocking in the same neighborhoods near Florence and Normandy that I ended up door knocking in 1999 when I came to work at the Community Coalition, I might have found myself right on the other side of this narrative. right? And so I think that we can't be afraid to say um, social upheaval is messy and social upheaval involved and has different types of expression within it. And that that does not take away from the political meaning and content of saying in that time period, there was an ideological campaign to sell to people the idea that LA was failing and burning because it was diverse. When in fact, what was happening was LA was burning in part because of the racial discrimination that was manifested in the cases that have been talked about today in economic restructuring that had literally, pol policymakers had literally allowed people to take jobs out of places like South LA, the valley where I live now, and put them in other countries so that it generated more profits for other people at the top. And that there was an hourglass economy in which people at the bottom were just not making it. And so I think to the extent that we can recognize those things as part of that story and inhabit the contradiction, as we like to say in our field, then I think we get a fuller picture. Mm -hmm. So inhabiting the contradiction is a good way to pivot. I want to ask uh, you, uh, Mark, this question. So you're a graduate student, um, deeply uh, connected with questions of social justice, studying uh, social justice. Is there a contradiction at all between how that moment uh, is represented and your understanding of politics that we're currently facing today? Is there any tension for you between the moment of Saigu, LA uprising, and uh, the contemporary moment, or, or do they connect in some organic way? Um, I, d I do think they connect. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, in terms of what Jerry said, we can, we can get in trouble. Um, I, I disagree. I, dis I, I disagree with you wholeheartedly. Um, the issue around politics, like when we, when, we, when, we, when we think about that particular action, like if, sometimes I leave the house and I'm just pissed off, and then a cop messes with me. And let's say I hit that cop. I may have had a no political intent, but the, but the, but the, but the issue, or what, what, the question I would like to ask about those particular actions is what relationship do they have to power? I don't, I don't care whether it's politics or not, but the, whatever we call it. Um, but I think it's extremely important that when we look at actions like that, when we make that decision to go and take that stuff, there may not be any articulatable intent involved, but, what if we ask this other question about what is, what's that action's relationship to power, then we start to get a positive analysis about the action and not just excluding it as non-political and then not engaging with it anymore. Um, so I just, just, I just, just, to, just to be clear on this point, because I hear you saying the same thing, uh, but I want to make sure that I'm hearing you both correctly. So I heard you saying, so in a way, that to ask the question about motivation with respect to the quote-unquote writer is to obscure the social conditions that might have produced that A and the social meaning that might attach to it in a political sense B. I hear you saying the same thing. Am I mishearing you? Yeah, and then C, how is that action diagnostic of power? Okay. So that's the, and then is there a connection between then and now? Is there a connection between 65, 92, and today? Um, yeah, there's, de there's definitely a connection. I just think that um, I know the question, a question that I've heard revolving over and over again that we always ask is, is it gonna happen again? 
And you're supposed to ask that question because you don't want to get shot or you don't want to get stabbed and you don't want your house to get burnt down. Um, but the, the major difference is not whether it's going to happen here, but where is it going to happen? Um, and thinking about history as an historian and looking at social movements, when we think about we have these massive um, convulsions uh, in, in, in urban areas, um, if we think about the period between 1963 and 1968, 250 uh, uh, civil, uh, civil incidents of violence between 1963 and 1968. And if we think about that, that moment, I mean, we had the great migration that was happening for decades. We have um, uh, uh, black folks in inner cities that are segregated, that are um, being deindustrialized. We don't have that anymore. Now black people are being displaced. Um, investment, development will not save you. So uh, development just is gonna mean dis displacement for, uh, for, for black communities. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, where are these processes forming in different places? Kelly Leiter Hernandez here at UCLA just um, completed a map of um, how much we spend on incarceration. It's a heat map of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you can see the rising rates of what we spend on incarceration is not happening in South LA. We still spend a lot. But black people are being displaced into places like Lancaster <coughs> and Pomona. That's where the next rebellion is going to happen. So the connections are there, but not this, but this, I think the spatial configuration of that violence is going to change in the future. So I want to put a pin in the idea that development will not save you because we need to take that quite seriously and think about the different forms that displacement takes. Before I do that, I want to invite Doe Kim into the conversation and ask you to respond to the general ob um, observation that it's not a question of whether we might see something like this again, but rather when. Your sense of the contemporary moment is that where you live as well? Meaning, it's not a question about whether, it's a question about when. A question about whether or not, about when? Not, not whether we might see something like what we saw 25 years ago. It's gonna happen. It's a question about when we might yes, see it. Yes. Is, that, is, is, is that where you are, or is that too much, um, too pessimistic of you? Well, <laughs> A year before Saigu happened, I told my roommates a couple things. I told them that Bill Clinton was going to be the president of the United States, because mm -hmm. I saw him speak at the Kennedy School, and I said, this man is smooth. Nobody knows about him. George Bush is running high from the Persian Gulf War, but I heard him speak, and he was so smooth. I said, he's going to be president. <coughs> the second thing I told uh, my roommates was that there's going to be a riot somewhere in this country. I don't know where, but it's going to be somewhere because we have too much hopelessness, we have too much unemployment, and what I knew was from where I lived, in Koreatown in Los Angeles, and in South LA, because the year before, 1991, uh, as a student, I got involved with the Black Korean Alliance and uh, working on uh, Latasha Harlan's issues, along with uh, Latasha Harlan's, and then two weeks after that, there were two Korean merchants that were shot and killed, and then two weeks after that, Tessam Park uh, shot and killed Lee Arthur Mitchell. And in that case, there was a 100-day boycott. So I knew, and, and, and then after that, there were five or six fire bombings that summer. So knowing that, I knew that uh, the fires could happen at any time. And so for me, uh, I predicted that. I, did, I just didn't know that it was gonna be in Los Angeles. Uh, but I think for me, it was really difficult because uh, as I was watching TV as well in my dorm room, uh, I could see them interviewing some looters. And that shopping mall was, I recognized that shopping mall, the Rodeo Galleria, which is only about a couple blocks from where my parents lived and where I grew up. And I think that's when it really hit me hard. It's kind of like when I saw uh, Koreatown burning, so my heart was also, my soul was also burning at the same time. And that's what made me want to come back to Koreatown and be part of the rebuilding process. So I, I don't think it's uh, uh, I don't think it's something that's out of the ordinary to say that it's a matter of when, it's not a matter of if. I still think it's a matter of when because there's so many conditions in Los Angeles and many where many places around the country that are not being addressed. And uh, uh, as also as a civil rights attorney that work that works on police misconduct cases, prisoner abuse cases, cases against the United States government. I see so many people coming in with uh, stories about what the police have done. And if we take a look at uh, you know, disturbances that happen around the country, many of them happen because of police misconduct issues. So I think, uh, can, can it still happen today? Yes, it can. 
on that pessimistic note, I want us to shift to um, Act 2, Jerry. So you might want to engage on a little bit more in Act 1 before we go to the contemporary moment. So I'll pivot to you and uh, have you manage it as you will. So this has already been an interesting conversation. I know that uh, council member, um, uh, I, I know that one of the council members, Marquise uh, Harris Dawson, has to exit soon. So I'm going to actually pivot in a particular kind of way. I want to pick up on the theme of power, right? And think about how power flows. We have media power, we have economic power, we have cultural power, we have physical power with guns in different kinds of ways. I want to put on the table just to set um, this kind of power. This is the power that you can see on the screen. This is the power of Ice Cube's uh, death certificate album and Black Korea. And the reason why I want to focus on this is that if you read the lyrics, I will not try to rap this. I will not try to uh, he read did, the- he, he did this morning, by the way. Uh, I will not try to read the lyrics. But the reason why, why I want to emphasize it is because it's an incredibly powerful song. That whole album is, an, I, we called them albums back then. That, that whole album was actually an incredibly powerful song. And what you hear in this is both resentment and hatred of Korean or Asian or Oriental merchants who are thinking that every brother in the world is out to take, watching every damn move I make, and he's indignant because he's contesting a form of racial profiling. And he says, you don't follow me, otherwise you will be held accountable through a nationwide boycott. You have to pay respect. Or will burn your sword right down to a crisp. The reason why I say this and put this on the table is because I want an honest conversation. Because on the one hand, what you have is a black man rapping about a particular experience of essentially racial profiling, not by the police in this context, but by private power. And from his perspective as a customer, he sees someone with power over him, the right to disrespect him every time he walks in to get a cold brew or to buy Pampers, whatever he's doing. On the other hand, Right? Think about how media power flows. In this context, he's a celebrity. He can make music. He is listened to in a way that Koreans are mute at that point in time. Although, again, hip hop culture has changed radically now. So I wanted to just set the stage on power. I know you have to check out. I, don't, I didn't mean to prime you with a hard question necessarily, but I wanted to think a little bit about the nature of power. And the one other thing that I want to show you is the changes in demographic power. This is from slides that came in uh, through, again, uh, through the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge. Paul Ong was the professor who's a lead on this. And what you see is from 1990 all the way to 2015, the yellowish uh, dots are more uh, African American, the gr uh, bluish dots are much more uh, Latino. And what you basically see, bottom line, is this. You have, within the study area, it used to be black, now it's Hispanic. Things have changed radically demographically, which means power has changed in different kinds of ways. So I just want to set the stage for power, to try to figure out how power has changed. And then I want actually more conversation ultimately on the question of are we actually being honest about how we wield power against each other, right? And it's sometimes too easy to blame the system general, maybe white power, white supremacy. Don't get me wrong, that's an important part of it, but how do we hold each other accountable, especially across minority groups in coalition building? Right. With that, <laughs> council member. Why, thank you. Um, it, it's actually, uh, I appreciate uh, the question uh, as difficult a, a curve as it was, because <laughs> when you were naming the, when you, the, we had the question about the media, well, nobody I knew was listening to Whitney Houston or MC Hammer or watching the news media, everybody I knew was listening to that record. Sure. I knew every, I mean, when you put that up there, I, I could actually rap it, because I had listened mm. to it so many times. Mm. Um, and, Funny. you know, the, both the death certificate record, the fear of a black planet record, the boogie down productions records that came out in 1991 uh, were big then. In addition, this same theme about the conflict between Korean merchants and African American residents was a big part of Do the Right Thing. Right. which was yeah, the right. biggest movie um, in the community leading up to the civil unrest. And you might remember, in fact, Do the Right Thing ends with a riot yeah. or a small version of a riot on a, on a block. So, I, you know, I think, again, I, I know this, the point of your question is to push us away from talking about the system, sure. but it's very difficult not to talk about the no, system I'll, because I'll the system set the terms of who's going to be in what neighborhoods who gets to have a store and who doesn't, 
and the state absolutely manages that relationship. So the community can't say, wait a minute, the people here don't have jobs. We, no one can come in and have a store until everybody, we have full employment, right? Until you make up for the jobs that left, right? You certainly can't come in and over-concentrate uh, alcohol and the other things that come with alcohol in a mm -hmm. situation where you've set people up to be depressed over a long period of time and then turn around and blame the merchant for that condition. So the, for me, this is absolutely uh, the, the big system. Banks deciding who to lend money to and who not to. Banks, insurance companies deciding who gets insurance and who doesn't and what kind of businesses they can open. And then the state deciding what laws we're going to enforce and which laws we're going to not going to enforce. So while there might be all kinds of violations in the merchant class, those don't get enforced. Small violations like loitering uh, amongst the community get enforced harshly. And that's not the decision of the merchant. The merchant, trust me, I'm on the LA City Council. Nobody tell, tells LAPD what to do. Not even David and me, right? Or the mayor or anybody else, especially at that time. The police department decides what to do. So they decide we're gonna enforce loitering and we're not gonna enforce anything else, right? There's a law that says you can't cover your windows with signs when you have a business. It's in very plain English, everybody knows. It's never enforced, right? No matter how many times people call and, and, and try to make that happen. And so I think uh, to the contrary, this song to me is not so much about the relationship between two people, two groups of color. It's about how the state is managing people that are disenfranchised and how the state sets up conflicts and then exploits the conflicts later. So, so that's a, a powerful analysis. I, I, and we're gonna tr follow up with the fact that again, now we have again, two co sitting council members, right, who have recently taken, um, uh, uh, taken their positions, and obviously that's a different kind of look and feel than what we had 25 years ago. But just this part about police and potentially police abuse, uh, Black Lives Matter, how it never changes. I want to uh, pivot then to Susan Burton for a moment, uh, if your mic is working, uh, and try to figure out, okay, Given your experience as a formerly incarcerated person, and as you think about how selective prosecution, you can create uh, neutral rules, but if you selectively prosecute, in light of everything we found out from Ferguson and whatnot, has the current situation changed from what we saw 25 years ago? The theme is power, and now we're talking about police and carceral power. What has changed, if anything? I was born in a housing project. Aliso Village in the early 50s. So I've been poor in the um, South LA, East LA, moved to South LA. And while I didn't know there was a disinvestment in me in my community until after my sixth prison term when I found a treatment facility in Santa Monica, uh, California to help me address the grief, the loss, and that, uh, that ultimately led to my addiction until I saw in that community that the people there didn't go to jail or prison for the things that I was going to jail for and my community was going to jail for in South LA. That's when the, the uh, switch flipped for me hmm. and I became angry at what had happened and what's continued to happen. Has anything changed? My entire community is criminalized. That's what I see in South LA. I drove here today from Watts. And when I got here, I was like, damn, look at this conference center. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn. It wasn't here in 92. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and 
Uh, shit, if I could just get this room invested in my community, it might be something going on. <laughs> And then I thought a little further around all of the, the um, production around the 1992 riots. If a fraction of that was invested mm -hmm. in my community, it might be a little different. But has anything changed? A woman last week came to a new way of life after 35 years of incarceration. She got released with $200 and adios and came back to the community. So it's, it's actually gotten worse because over the last 40 years, the tool of incarceration has been widely used in our community. It's been, you know, totally criminalized. You can't knock on a door in South LA where someone hasn't been affected by incarceration. And that really causes uh, collateral consequences that are just devastating to the livelihood, the health, the well-being, the possibilities, uh, and the uh, tortures experience that that person, their families, all experienced as a result of incarceration. So it's for me, it, it is not a matter also of if. You know, it's a matter of when, and you know. Me and many of my community members are under no illusion about an investment. Mm -hmm. And if an investment comes, it's so burdensome that it, it, it turns into a disinvestment. Sure, sure. So we got to watch that too. My mom used to say, all money ain't good money. Yeah, so, so this is unfortunately a, a depressing story. It's about large systems, large structures. Uh, including, again, uh, a, police, uh, a police enforcement strategy that actually tends to incarcerate entire communities, anxieties about continuing disinvestment. I'm going to show you. But I, I want to yeah. say, though, don't let it be a depressing story because of the resilience, the creativity, and the ability of the community to, to, to rise above and stand up, reach out, help each other, build, build together, be creative, underground economy. And I'm not talking about an illegal economy. You know? I understand. So, I mean, so. and, I wanna, and I wanna embrace the possibility that we could actually solve these problems going forward. Um, and I don't mean to actually be too pessimistic or too optimistic, neither Pollyannish uh, nor overly negative about what's possible, because things have changed in different kinds of ways. But I wanna pile on just for the moment, a little more negativity, sorry. But <laughs> okay. the reason why, the reason why is because the data sometimes is useful in the following sense. And so here's more information about how so socioeconomic status within the LA areas that actually suffered the most from the 1992 uh, 92, uh, urban unrest. This is what we see. This is again, the stuff from the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge produced here at UCLA. Basically, what this chart does is maps out increasing unemployment rate or increasing poverty rate. So if you go in this direction, that is worse. And for all these communities, almost all of them, you see actually things getting somewhat worse. Koreatown, more unemployment. You've got Northwest South LA, Southwest South LA, Westlake Pico Union. Almost all these neighborhoods currently, as measured by unemployment rate or poverty rate compared to 1992, it's actually worse. It isn't better. So I just want to put that on the table. If I think the police are still the police, if I think the economic subordination or the lack of opportunity is actually spirit killing, which leads people to be incredibly frustrated, what else are they going to do, right? If I think that those are the circumstances, what can I start looking into, especially as, again, we pass a quarter century? Now I want to switch to, again, Council Member Ryu. You are, again, the first Korean American ever to hold a position on city council. It was a, it, it's a historic moment for folks who are Asian American, for Korean American. You have a really, you should describe to us the interesting collections of people you actually represent, given the geography, and then you tell me when you see information like this. What has changed and what is the current state of affairs? <coughs> um, well, you know, um, I think the first, the biggest misconception, because I am Korean American, everyone assumes I represent Koreatown. Actually, my, my district that I represent is one of the most homogeneous districts, meaning it's 80% Caucasian. And actually, I don't represent Koreatown. 
um, which uh, gives a couple of contradictions, but I think it's a, it's a, it, it gives a sign in the right direction where um, hopefully we're all moving towards uh, blurring racial lines and hopefully working together. So regardless of who you are, um, you know, people will try to vote or, or work with folks based on their ability or who, what they represent. But you know, um, this is a very interesting question. I think that the thing about, um, uh, I, I, I agree, uh, it's a matter of where, not when. Um, and as a sitting council member, and I am optimistic, and I think we made tremendous strides in the last 25 years. Is it enough? Of course not. There's plenty more we need to do. But I think in the city of Los Angeles, it wouldn't have, it, it will not happen again. Because, and I think Marquis Harris Dawson just left. We sat on another panel discussion, uh, I think yesterday, and he pointed out one clear difference between 92 and now. In 92, the police pulled out. Chief Darrell Gates pulled out. They did not protect and serve whether it's Koreatown or South LA, anywhere, they just pulled back. Um, the current, and, and also the police force, as well as many other uh, areas throughout government is a lot more diverse. The police force more represents the people that they serve. Um, it, does it solve all problems? Of course not. There's still a lot more we need to do, so it will not happen again. Um, and we will have a much faster, prompter response, and we have more community policing. Uh, we still have more, and there's still police brutality issues, less in Los Angeles, but it still exists, and we're trying to fix that. And I think it goes to the question of power that you asked yeah. earlier. And I think um, what, what the uh, professor was trying to say was, I, I believe Marcus and the professor were actually saying the same things. And I agree, because at the end of the day, it's not just about power, it distills down to politics. Because the, like the song that you put up with um, Ice Cube, they're angry. But what are you angry at? Are you angry because you know, you, you're being overcharged five times more for a can, for a soda can, than anywhere else? Or are you angry because you don't have money to buy it? Or are you angry because you don't have a job? Lack of opportunity. Or are you angry because your school district is spending more on metal detectors than books? Yeah, yeah. So it becomes an issue of poverty and as a council member, and, and this is where we change those policies to hire the police force, to recruit those who are um, a diverse, have diversity, to have policies where we, tr where we um, make it more um, uh, conducive to uh, community building. So, so I know Jerry wants to follow up, but I just want to put um, a seed in that I hope we don't allow the discussion about structure, which we absolutely must have to obscure question about individual responsibility. To put this another way, um, people might on the one hand make arguments about racial segregation, and on the other hand, make choices about where they live. People on the one hand make points about public education and the need that we should value it, and on the other hand, send their kids to private school. So the cumulative effect of our private personal choices is the entrenchment of the macro things we otherwise contest. So I'm hoping that at some point we can have a conversation where there's a question about individual political responsibility to each other that do not get elided by points about structure, which is not to say that's what you did or what was done before, sure. but it's to return to the question that you asked uh, and what motivated your, your um, reproduction of those lyrics. So one more, so uh, we're gonna close out act two in the following way. I, uh, again, it's, the, it's an examination of the contemporary situation through thinking about power and what has changed. One place that I wanna think about is culture change in different kinds of ways. Has this generation or has the past 25 years led to a culture of either multiculturalism or sensitivity, anxiety about microaggressions such that we as a people, whether it be on well-resourced schools on the west side or, or other places, get along better culturally. And I thought it would be interesting whenever I ask this kind of question, people often say, well, look, the one place where culture has changed radically in the past 20 years is how we deal with LGBTQ people, right, in different kinds of ways, or how different axes actually are dealt with. Like, even if we haven't changed that much about race, we certainly can change. Look at what we've done. We're post-gay marriage now. We're in a post-society in that way. I wanted to know whether you, Eric Watt, had particular views about the intersection between one category, uh, LGBTQ, and the relevant, and, and basically the silence that that community 
the silence with which that community is treated in the context of what happened in 1992 and whether when you hear perhaps optimistic stories about the possibility of culture change and, and the experience of LGBTQ and specifically gay marriage as an example, do you feel like, yeah, that you got it, you killed it, that's exactly right, or you have no idea what you're talking about. Stop opening your mouth, that's not how things go. Well, let me start by saying when I, when I came out in the late 80s and early 90s, 1992 saw that I was pretty much out by that time, um, the LGBT Asian Pacific Islander community was relatively new. So the first organization in LA was founded in 1980. So it was about 12 years old. There was few that came along uh, uh, a few years after 1980, but, but they're still trying to figure out who they were. And the model that they used to organize around is a safe space model, which meant that they wanted to create a space where other LGBT API could, could feel comfortable with themselves and, and eventually come, come out, right? And it's a very closed, insular space. It doesn't really encourage advocacy or direct action, uh, except for the very few on the top and the leadership level who are out already. So when I came out, and I had the benefit of being at UCLA where I came out with other students of color, um, when I went into community and worked in the community, I don't need a safe space. I want to do stuff, right? Especially after the 92 uprising, which politicized a lot of us. And a lot of us would have to find things to do that is in a broader struggle, you know, like immigrant rights and workers' rights, which is where I cut my teeth as an act activist, uh, environmental justice, reproductive health. And the unintended byproduct of that is we had to think and act intersectionally. We had to think of ways to bring other people into the conversation that might not see the direct need for that conversation. And the, the 90s, like the, the best of, um, of white supremacy hits, you know, you have even before 1992, Governor Wilson, whom you mentioned, vetoed AB 101, which was a big deal in the LGBT community. Um, and then right after 1992, there's Prop 187, three strikes happened in, also in 1994. Right, and then affirmative action. Prop 209. Prop 209, bilingual education, welfare reform. Uh, it, just keep, it just kept on going and going, right? Uh, the, the thing that's different now is we had all of that in the last 99 days. Um, so it's much, and it's in one person, so the international intersectionality is much clearer now to me. And that's exciting, not in the way that the consequence of it, but in the way, as a way to organize, and people are seeing that, right? So, so same-sex marriage did change the way that we think about intersectionality in that way. Not so much for the white LGBT community, because I think that was like a one-and-done deal for most people in, I'm being reductionist because of time, but, um, but for, for LGBT API communities, it changed because our progressive allies, straight allies in the API community really stepped up. So Prop 22 was um, in 2000. And one of the first press conferences that I went to in Prop 22 was organized by the progressive Korean community. So I think Kiwa, I don't know if Alessandro was here, is here anymore, but Kiwa, I think <coughs> was part of that, Korean Resource Center was part of that, the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, and now Advancing Justice Los Angeles was also a part of that. They took the lead because at that time there wasn't like a queer API organization, right? So when that, when, when that organization came around, API Equality came around, they decided to ask advancing justice to be a fiscal sponsor, right? So because they want to position themselves in that civil right conversation, right? And it makes sense. And I think there is a lot more, of, and, and, and it changed only because I felt like there's a lot more working shoulder to shoulder between um, our brothers and sisters in the community. So fast forward, I think, to now where I'm on the board of a youth serving organization in Long Beach, Kamai Girls in Action. So we do youth organizing in Long Beach. Um, every time I go to a meeting at KGA, I'm not only asked to identify myself by my name and affiliation, I have to also announce my uh, preferred gender pronoun. And that's not only in KGA, I've experienced this in other communities where gender identity might not be the work that they do, but it's a culture that has, so I'm gonna use this word, but infiltrated, <laughs> I mean in a good way. Um, so that, the progressive community. Right. I think that's a good thing, where I think we have, there were spaces now where we can do things intersectionally in that way. 
And I think young people have a different relationship intersectionality than, than, yeah. than us 25 years ago. Yeah. Like um, one of our friends was saying that her, uh, his teenage daughters just didn't understand like, why is this a big deal that transgender people have a choice in using the bathroom of the choice, right? That's just, I, I, they just don't get it. Why is this a big deal? And I think that's a really encouraging change um, in, in how, we, how we make those connections too. Yeah. So we need, uh, let's pivot back to Act 3, although the conversation back to the contemporary diagnosis, especially of power and what we can do in the future, they will play back and forth uh, with each other. And we'll have time to, again, continue this conversation free form. But now back to Devin. Yes, yeah, so Act 3 is really just a question about the future. So in some ways, we're going to force optimism. <laughs> we're talking about the future. <laughs> we're going to be optimistic people. And I want to start by the impressions People get ready, there's a train coming. You don't need no baggage, just yeah. get on board. So people are gonna get on board your train. And I'm asking specifically Lisa, Mark Anthony, and Esther. Um, so I want you to say something about the work that you're doing, A, because we haven't heard about it yet, and B, to think about the end game. When I teach my courses, we always have debates about how do you get to a place of justice. And when I say you have your magic wand, tell me what your place of justice look like, I get silence. We will not have silence today, here, A, and we will not have pessimism, B. So I wanna know where your train is going to in the context of some of the work that you're doing. So um, let's start with Lisa. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am a perennially optimistic person. Ah, that was terrific. a good question for me. <clears throat> Although I just got done giving a speech yesterday at Cal State North that saying that I was particularly depressed, more so than I have been probably my entire life the last three months. But I'm finding my way out of it, so it's good that you asked me this question today. Um, so just a teeny bit of context, I was a student. Um, and, or I should say I was a very recent graduate. I was an administrative assistant with a local community-based organization, Asian Pacific Healthcare Venture in Los Angeles um, in 1992. I've been gone in Washington, D.C. and out of Los Angeles for the past basically 25 years. Okay. Uh, so it's very interesting to me to come back. It's kind of like I've been, the, I've done this Rip Van Winkle thing where I've, my L.A. self was asleep and uh, you know, now I'm back and I'm looking at the city uh, my community, and um, and uh, I now live in Crenshaw, um, you know, and looking at what's going on um, after this passage of time. Um, I do, and I, you know, was also looking at some of these, um, the new data about, you know, what has changed, what hasn't changed. Um, very interesting. So um, what I did at National Capacity, the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development, um, we were focused on low-income Asian Americans and Pacific Islander community-based organizations in low-income communities, uh, doing um, community and economic development work in a multiracial context. Uh, low-income Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are more likely to live with other poor communities of color uh, as opposed to with other uh, wealthy Asians in the, in, for the most part. Uh, so that's also interesting um, data to look at in terms of the patterns of segregation, whether it's really by race or whether it is by uh, economic status, right? And so uh, for the most part, um, so, so just in terms of the, what is hopeful, uh, some of the things that you know, we have been working on is to uh, increase our, uh, I think, uh, literacy on the, the language of uh, white supremacy and structural racism uh, with community-based organizations so we can actually talk about it. Because so often with like li limited English proficient community organizations and advocates, um, oftentimes the advocacy ends up sounding like, what about the Asians, right? Where's our fair share of the pie? Right? And I don't think that that is taken very well. And so I think that we've been working on that. Um, and so at National Capacity, a couple of years ago, we sort of did this pivot. Instead of saying that we are you know, focusing on low-income Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, we really started talking about the neighborhoods in which we worked and what solutions were going to uh, bring change in those neighborhoods, not just justice for the Asians, right? Or yeah. Pacific Islanders or Native Hawaiians. So we've been having this conversation amongst community-based service providers and activists and been trying to really lift up these new models of work. Uh, because I do think that, you know, the, the right claims Asian Americans as people of color all the time. They do it really well. The left, not so much, ironically, right? 
they actually talk when you, um, oftentimes still people talk about people of color and I don't feel that they're actually talking about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, not as a critique, but oftentimes because they don't have access to the data that shows need in our community, right? And so one of the challenges I think for um, social justice, racial justice efforts is to actually embrace Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, communities in need and that have sa faced many of the same conditions in low-income neighborhoods because if you don't claim us, the right will, right? And so I think that we've been trying to lift up things like the, um, the, uh, the coalitions that bring together young people uh, that have been facing deportation, detention, and incarceration and having a broader frame around that, right? So there are organizations like Freedom Inc. that is a black and Hmong organization in the, in the Midwest. You know, look, looking at the Southeast Asian Freedom Network and their work with Black Lives Matter, uh, there is a lot of really interesting work that's going on that needs to be embraced by the AAPI community and by the racial justice broader community. Um, uh, and and uh, I just really think that um, the, some of the tweaks that we can make to our narrative uh, about what racial justice looks like um, uh, are actually fairly simple. I think that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders also really need to take on um, the, uh, very clearly uh, anti-blackness in our own community. Um, and I think that we also really, in a very concrete way, right? And I think that um, if we, we just have to be really clear that if we want equity for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, that we have to take on structural racism and really understand white supremacy and how that impacts our work. So I think that that's the work that a lot of community-based organizations, community organizers around the country are doing. They just had the very first convening called Grassroots Asian Americans um, Rising, uh, which, which was all the young organizers. Um, so I do think that there is hope. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, uh, we also need to start thinking about um, how we transform these ethnic specific organizations that are like Chinese American cream. I, 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 no critique, I mean, we can have this conversation later, but I think that there's a fragility to this presumption mm -hmm. that we have something in common because we are of a particular ethnicity and that coalitions that really are focused on shared values are the way of the future. And I do see examples of that. So, uh, Jerry, if you could um, put the cover of Time magazine up uh, as we think through this a little bit more. Um, so, thank you for that. Um, I, I don't know what your um, world looks like. I have a sense of how we might get there. So, um, we'll, we'll see if at the end of the day I have a vision of my just world. I'm not there yet, though I hear about some necessary conditions for getting there. So, Mark Anthony, weigh in again a little bit about your work and um, the end game, what's LA supposed to look like? What's the nation supposed to look like? I'm trying again, I might fail at this exercise I typically do with my students, but I'm not giving up. Carry on. Um, so, a um, few things. Uh, so, I'm, my organization, Dignity and Power, now started about four and a half years ago, um, not too long before Black Lives Matter. In fact, the founder of our organization is one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors. Uh, and I think what the reason I'm also very optimistic is because what we have seen over the last uh, five years is more organizations, more collectivity, uh, particularly around organizations that are looking at anti-blackness, um, emerge and coalesce in a really strategic way. And I think that's very, very exciting. Um, when, I t when we're talking about vision, um, the clearest thing that I can point to is the Movement for Black Lives policy platform, mm -hmm. uh, which um, I worked on uh, with a team of folks and helped facilitate um, you know, over 70 organizations across the country, uh, specifically black specific organizations across the country, coming up and thinking about what, where are we going, what does it look like, and there's some really powerful, clearly articulated visions um, there. And I'll speak specifically to our vision in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been working on, uh, our organization is an abolitionist organization. Uh, we believe that uh, prisons as we know it do not function to produce public safety. Um, and as we're working to do that, and as we're working to move resources into community alternatives, we are also doing other things <coughs> like civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Department. And so part of my optimism comes from the fact that we, as a small organization, we're able to coalesce and bring together organizations across LA County um, that now, after three years, we're able to win civilian oversight over the largest sheriff's department in the country, running the largest jail system in the world. 
uh, which I think is really important. Uh, particularly post-92 rebellion, you know, Twin Towers was, was finished in 1997, 98. Uh, it is the largest mental health facility in the country. Uh, black folks are 9% of the county population and we're 43% of the population in that facility. And so my vision is that there are no black folks in the county jail system, in the, in the mental health facilities that, that are functioning, uh, the jails that are functioning as mental health facilities, that they, our folks are actually home in community-based treatment. Uh, and we are part of a coalition of folks who are pushing for that. Uh, my vision is that we're having real conversations around reparations. Uh, if we look at Chicago, which won a very uh, powerful fight after 10 years uh, for folks who were tortured by the, by the police department, won very clear reparations, uh, including education for families, including money, including free psychological care, including free tuition for families. All those things are part of the imagination that we can access right now because of real wins that are happening when it comes to state violence that aren't just about reaction, but are thinking very creatively about how we can win these things in our neighborhoods right now. So dignity and power now, for me, um, it is, is one of the places in where that vision is being, being actualized. And I'll end with my particular position. Um, uh, I'm the Director of Health and Wellness at Dignity and Power now, and it took, I don't know, maybe about 10 years of doing movement work for me to be in a movement organization that was actually thinking about and creating and, and implementing health and wellness and trauma and resilience work into the actual healing work, mm. I mean, into the actual movement work. And for me, that is um, a really powerful um, shift that I have not seen um, in the work that I've been doing previous to DPN. It's not that it hadn't existed, but to formalize it, and I think our organizations around the country are actually talking about health as a strategy for building power. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing that we need to be thinking about right now. So I'm gonna ask um, Esther Twain as well, and, and you should all uh, ready up uh, because we're gonna have a rapid fire with respect to what you perceive to be some takeaway action items. So ready up for that, but, but I wanna get you again to tell us a little bit about your work and um, your vision of uh, the society that we might want. Thanks, um, and I just wanna say, um, uh, Council of Korean Americans is proud to partner with UCLA on this wonderful event, so thank you for doing that, and, and Jerry is a member of CKA as well. Um, and I think I'm the only person who doesn't live in LA, maybe. I, I grew up partly in LA, I'm a diehard Lakers fan, uh, but I do live in Washington, D.C. now. And um, I think there's a lot of optimism, but I'll just start with one story. I live in um, just outside of Washington, D.C., McLean, Virginia. It's uh, Fairfax County, the second wealthiest county in the country, very diverse, lots of immigrants from many different parts of the world. Um, and I live in the suburbs, and just in our kids' school, about a month ago, we <coughs> had a sign that had the N-word and a swastika. And I had to have, the, I have a, fourth, a third grader and a kindergartner, and I had to sit them down and tell them what these things were and uh, why, you know, if ever somebody says, go back to China or Korea, how they should re uh, respond. And that was not an easy conversation to have because um, they're not sure why these things matter. I just took them to um, the, the National African American uh, Museum, the brand new beautiful museum in Washington, D.C. If any of you come to visit, please go, go uh, visit it. You could spend days in there. So I'm explaining to my kids who Queen Latifah is and you know, her legacy and you know, different um, in incredible figures in, in black history. Uh, and at the end of three hours, my, my kindergartner says, Mom, what's African American again? You know, and so you know, kids these days don't see color the way I think many of us grew up, and um, and I'm, have, I'm having to explain to them why adults talk about it in this way. And so I think the optimism there is that um, kids are growing up in a, uh, I hope, less color-focused world. Their friends are from all over, um, and that we as adults have a have a duty. Um, to, of course, not forget the past, but explain how um, we want to see the world and help educate them um, to be in a world where we would be less uh, 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 race-focused. Um, that said, uh, because of these kinds of things that are happening now, we can't uh, uh, not talk about the past. I will say, for those of us who didn't vote for Trump, if there is a silver lining, it, it is that um, it has gotten this national discourse on race issues and intersectionality and all of those things that I think um, we have been talking about, but it wasn't front and center. And it wasn't at a, at a level that um, I, I think it has come to because of Trump and uh, his campaign and, and his advisors. 
And so I think we should take advantage of that. I now live in a city where every week there's a protest in Washington, D.C. You know, the Women's March was incredible. I'm sure, I hope that many of you participated in the Women's March in, in your cities. But there were people of all colors, all different ages, all different gender identities, um, protesting for the same thing. And so I, that gives me hope that there is a grassroots movement that can address these difficult issues and the difficult past that, that we have. And I will say, you know, from our community, Korean American community, so Council of Korean Americans uh, was, was started um, because of another event that was very important in the Korean American, the history of Korean Americans, which is the Virginia Tech massacre, if you all remember, the Korean American uh, man who, you know, unfortunately shot a bunch of uh, folks in Virginia Tech. And after which, um, there was nobody who could speak for our community. And so if you remember, um, he was being portrayed as a foreigner and you know, all these kinds of things. And ultimately, the Korean ambassador to the United States got up and apologized. Oh, we're so sorry this happened. And really, this is a kid who grew up in the United States. He was Korean American. <laughs> and um, I think what we realized is, I think you mentioned this, Jerry, that we are incredibly silent as Asian Americans, as Korean Americans in this country. Uh, we don't have a member of any, you know, a, a, a member of Congress. We're, um, and there are many reasons for why we haven't been vocal or, or don't have a voice in this country. But we're trying to change that. And I think communication, having a voice, will um, uh, will go a long way towards addressing, um, I think, some of these issues that we've talked about all day all day today. So the um, Council of Korean Americans is very focused on collaborating with other communities of color, um, uh, because you know I, I think. It, Asian Americans are 7% of the population. Is that right, Tegu? I think you said 7%. Um, it, we're very small. And, and there are many issues that cross uh, all communities of color. And so I, I, I think, um, as opposed to, I, there are still folks in the media that want to pit different minority groups against each other. And, and, and you see that with the model minority myth, myth and being used uh, against uh, Latinos or African Americans. And so I think it's more important than ever today for all communities of color to come together on issues that we all care about. And frankly, all Americans care about jobs and economic prosperity and the American dream. And um, our politicians, no offense, uh, uh, sometimes play uh, these things off of us, uh, off of each other. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us, and I think this is the time where people are more motivated and actively, uh, and there's a grassroots energy around uh, these issues. And, and I will say, um, uh, on my Facebook feed, there, after the Baltimore riots, I mean, we, we still have these riots, um, you know, so many of my Asian American brothers and sisters were talking about why Black Lives Matters matters, why we need to go protest, why we need to support our African American brothers and sisters. And so I'm hopeful that this is the beginning of a long journey and that we'll get there. So, Jerry, I'm going to send it back to you so that we can think about what the uh, last word segment before we uh, close it out. Yeah, I mean, part, part of it is, I mean, I could actually just have this conversation for hours, and it would be incredibly entertaining. These great uh, members of the audience have uh, persevered. And so I'm ultimately going to ask you for, uh, unfortunately, just an exit, uh, exit comment. And the question is, give the audience one thing that you want them to remember or do to get you to whatever you believe to be the promised land. If Martin Luther King says that, you know, the arc of justice, you know, it, the arc of the universe actually bends to truth, it takes a long time, I get it. How do you help bend it towards justice in a particular kind of way? And what is it that individuals can do? When you give that one piece of advice or that one thing to really remember, I'll give you one hard problem to think about. The hard problem, and it can go in multiple ways. When I talk to many people my parents' generation, I'll just own it. There are many Koreans of my parents' generation who don't understand why I would do the job that I do. They find it largely incomprehensible. <laughs> I, I just, I'm just calling it out. They're just like, why would you do that? It's not for your people, it's not this, it seems to be a waste of your time, do you get paid more? Like, why are you doing it? The reason why I brought up that question is how do we have the hard conversations to talk to maybe our elders? And it's not, I don't want to stereotype them either. They've got, you've got unbelievable people who showed tremendous love and loyalty to all kinds of basic decent values, fundamentally decent people who've crossed racial lines. But how do I and other people have that hard conversation with other folks of color, including their own races, including their own ethnicities, including their own families? 
And it happens also, right? No one is immune. Everyone does this in their own way, right? When Chris Rock, when he does this, you know, brilliant critique of Oscar So White and then trots out a bunch of Asian kids as the punchline for a joke and doesn't realize at least the irony of it, mm -hmm. right? You got to own that. that. Come on. How do you have that conversation? Or maybe that conversation isn't necessary. I want you to think about what we should learn, what we could remember, uh, and then help me have these hard conversations. It is what I try to do every day. Uh, that's the challenge. Maybe we'll just go this way down the road. So, uh, Sel, you're up. One of the things that helped me um, be effective as a community organizer in South LA in the landscape that Eric was describing was to um, give myself permission to inhabit a contradiction that I think is posed as a false dichotomy. And I, I think we should re reject all the false dichotomies including the choice between riot or rebellion, individual agency or structural determinism. One of the most powerful things I learned uh, when I was here studying critical race theory was Derek Bell's work, which was giving me the courage to speak a truth that I felt in my gut, which is perhaps racial equality is not achievable in a country that is built on white supremacy and economic exploitation and that there was something powerful in giving myself permission to release myself from my own racial idealism and to fight like hell because that there is beauty in that struggle and the possibility that might come from releasing ourselves from these tropes of idealism, from these false choices that would allow more authentic relationships and political clarity to emerge. So don't drink the juice, but keep fighting. Hmm. Keep fighting. Eric Watt. Wow. So I, I'm reminded by a documentary about James Baldwin I saw earlier this week called I'm Not Your ne Negro. And um, <coughs> it's brilliant because it, for, for one of very few rare times, like he placed it, um, the pathology of racism not on black people themselves but on white supremacists, right? And, and if you look at the, uh, those of you who are here for the lunch uh, keynote, you saw some of the statistics. And you come across these statistics that, like, for the, for the most part, Asian Americans, African Americans, Latinos, like up to 70, 80 percent are feeling very similarly in terms of the, their party affiliation, at least, right? The split is in the white population. So I think a lot of the stuff, events that we're going to make, it's going to have to move some of that. Am I the person to convince white people to go that way? I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe I am. I just haven't figured out a way to do that yet. But I felt like this is a, a moment where we're going to ask our white progressive allies to step up and talk to their people. I'll talk to my father. It's, it's a burden out there. <coughs> but I think other people have to kind of think about how do, how do we talk to others really, um, really, really critically as well. And I, I'm so sort of heartened by a lot of the protests that's been happening since the election because <laughs> white people are really angry. <laughs> and they're coming up. And you can see that. And it's great. You know, so... Um, so I think there's some optimism there, but I think part of the conversation is how do we also move the, the, that, that population in a way, it's not just about us doing our work, we'll keep doing our work, but it's not gonna be enough if that population is gonna be stagnant. Thank you, way. thank you, Eric. Marcus. Um, I don't know, I'm thinking about it, I think my advice is not for the people in the room. Um, really, I'm gonna be honest, do the work like your life depends on it. Like the, yes. when I think about the rebellion in the way that I've talked about it in the past myself, we make it seem like that was a moment where we had the least amount of clarity. But when you're the, 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 the times that I've uh, either felt the most free or knew that I was trying to get free is the closer to death that you get. And so they're, they're, they were closer to liberation than anybody in this room. Um, and you have to work with that kind of urgency like, like your life depends on it. And if we're not willing to, but that doesn't mean that we have to have divisions and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm gonna be honest with you, um, unity is the least common denominator of the kind of work that we should be doing together. And the reason why I feel that way um, is because it's cheap. It, re it requires the folks who don't have shit to do all the work, to, to carry all the labor and to do all the burden, and then the people that have stuff don't have to do nothing. That's and just say that you could be, you know, that you can have unity. So if you, and that's why I'm saying it's really not for most of the people in this room, because a lot of people in this room are comfortable enough not to die tomorrow for it. 
And that's the reason why those folks on the ground are the, they're the, they're the closest to liberation. That's the why, you know, in peasant rebellions, it happens there. That's why it happens in revolutions when people are willing to die. I'm not saying that the violence is necessary. I'm saying that if you're not willing to engage in this work with that kind of audacity, then it, that's required. Thanks. So yeah, do the work with that kind of urgency. Council Member you. Well, Professor Kang, since uh, we're, we're giving the longer answers and not following necessary directions, I want to uh, have, a, a, on a positive note, you know, I want to thank the, uh, the voters, because we're doing a lot of things that uh, many of the other panelists spoke about. I want to thank the voters of the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles for passing measure HHH, which is a $1.4 billion bond to house, house homelessness, to have rapid rehousing. Uh, for passing measure H, which, is, mm -hmm. which would generate $355 million a year for service programs, for mental health, for all these um, social, uh, social services that are much sorely needed. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the voters of Los Angeles for voting for one of the most progressive and diverse city council members, where we have three openly gay council members. Uh, we have the first Korean American council member. We, have, we still have a lack of diversity in women, but for also voting for a city council, progressive city council that uh, created the $10 million justice fund for civil rights and immigration for um, creating um, a pro pro one of the most progressive programs and, and being one of the uh, leading advocates uh, throughout the nation. So the one advice I wanna give, which is the most simplest thing to do, yet the hardest, is register to vote and vote because decisions are made by those who show up. Thank you. Esther Lee. You just stole my line. Okay, so, uh, I was good. so it's the same advice. <laughs> Elections matter, right? Who is in the White House matters, who is in, in the City Hall matters. Uh, and, and there's a saying in Washington, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So if there are issues you care about, you have to vote for those people and push those people, keep, keep them accountable. Push those people on the issues that you care about. And I don't think we do enough of that. So same advice. Joe Kim. I think one advice that I would give is for what we can do personally, all of us can do, is to learn about other people's cultures and histories. Uh, for me, when I went to college, I majored in, one of the best things that I did was major in African American studies. And when I did that, people thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But today, that kind of thinking has stayed with me forever. It's one of the best decisions I made, no matter what. Because what it did was this, I was looking like this, but when I started taking African American courses in history and politics and economics and literature, this is what happened. Now my blinders were this way. I had a more fuller view of the world and the racism and discrimination mm -hmm. that I was not taught, but I experienced and understood. When somebody calls you, on, when, when you're walking on the street and somebody says, go back home, you fucking yellow dog, I remember that for the rest of my life. Every single word that that person said to me, those four people, white people in that Jeep that ran by, rode by, I remember that to this day. And so for me, uh, learning about African American history is very important. And that reminds me of something that uh, W.B. Du Bois talked about in his book, The Souls of Black, the double consciousness. Mm -hmm. To be able to look at a world through the white eyes, but also to be able to look at the world through the black eyes and what you've experienced. You have two different mindsets and perspectives. I would like to just add on to that, that we could also have triple consciousness and even quadruple consciousness. If we learn another language, if we learn another history, language is a window into understanding a people and to understanding a mindset. And I would love for us to all be able to understand different mindsets. And uh, that would be my advice. Mark Anthony Johnson. Um, I think um, for me, the piece of advice I would give uh, is that you know we're in a really, really critical moment, as everyone knows, um, and is out of control and as compulsive and as impulsive as 45 is. He's, him and his, um, his team are also very strategic. <laughs> um, and I would say that uh, this is a moment for us to be very strategic. Uh, and spe even more specifically, the history of breaking down coalitions in the United States, particularly multiracial coalitions, um, is a history of seducing people out of solidarity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if we look at Bacon's Rebellion, where black folks and slaves um, 
rebelled against slave owners, that was right after that is when you saw whiteness as an identity start to get formed legally. Uh, and that was to seduce white people out of multiracial solidarity. And so my challenge to all of us is to have take very rigorous inventory of how are we being seduced out of the most effective strategies it's going to take to win. Lisa mm Asagawa. -hmm. So much to say, but I will just say this. Um, there was a report that came out that was called uh, uh, Asian Americans, right or left of the color line. And that was produced by an organization called Change Lab, and they continue to blog and write about Asian Americans and racial justice, and uh, with the context of what it means uh, uh, in the context of white supremacy and what anti-blackness looks like in very concrete ways and uh, intellectual ways, right? Um, so I think that Scott Nakagawa and Soya Jung have this um, organization and they are doing a lot of writing, so I would just gift that to the audience and everyone who's watching because I think that um, it's a conversation that's ongoing. Uh, and so, and just even that concept of right or left of the color line. And if we kind of don't make a decision and lock arms as people of color with a shared fate, I think that um, it's gonna be very easy for us to, as a community, to get used. And um, so I just hope that, uh, you know, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders will um, solidify as part of a more progressive voice in this country. So um, change lab, race labs, Thank you. Darnell uh, Hunt. right or left of the color lines. Well, I think that, um, I think we need to um, always keep in mind that at base, when we talk about divisions like race, when we talk about gender, when we talk <laughs> about sexual orientation, we're basically talking about masks for privilege. We're talking about ways in which people are divided so that other people can um, you know, enjoy their power, enjoy their privileges. So the whole issue of linked fate, I think is key. I think you know, we talk about people of color, but also white people. You know, they are damaged by race and racism. And I think that in that sense, we're all linked. Um, they may think that in the short term, they're, they're being sort of having certain privileges they're enjoying, but in the long term, there's a very select group that's really calling the shots. And I think that that awareness, that consciousness, is what we have to um, you know, continually uh, push forward so we don't get seduced into you know, thinking that uh, we're gonna be fighting over the crumbs that are left over between the various groups. Um, another point I wanna, I wanna make too is um, the whole um, uh, issue of social media. Um, if you think back to uh, the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, and, and what was successful about that, I mean, it failed in certain ways. It never really dealt with economics. It, it kind of you know, uh, made some headway in terms of segregation, political participation, those things. But the reason it was able to kind of move forward the way it did is because everyone had a role to play. And the roles weren't the same. I mean, there were some people who were leading in, other, in some ways, other people were doing legal strategy, uh, some people were you know, doing nonviolent um, philosophy. Um, there were a range of different things that people did, and everyone had something to contribute. And they actually went out and they put themselves on the line. My worry about social media is that it can create the illusion that we're participating when we really aren't, that there's vicarious participation, that if you like it on Facebook or if you retweet it, then you've done something, as opposed to actually making those connections that really honor our linked fate and, and, and do something in the real world. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Susan Bird. Yes. You know, so I talked about where I came from, and you know, I recognized that most of my life I was just trying to survive the stuff in the community. And when I got beyond that in a place that I could think about, you know, um, how the community looked, how other communities looked and what effect that had and the light came on. That was my light. It might not have been my brother's light or my sister's light or my neighbor's light, but that was my light. And uh, when I came back to the community and opened my house, uh, got a house and opened it to women, I got into strong confrontation with my friends and my family because I was letting women just like me come into that home for prison, from prison to uh, start a new life. So it was, um, so I had to stay true to my dream, to, to the vision I had been given and what I knew had to be done. 
And so that's what I've done uh, going forward. I, I just really enjoy the partnership with the legal department because people, and, and, and had I not stayed true to that vision, we'd have never been able to share that partnership where people can you know, come and get legal services and it's on and on. Um, so, you know, I'll have a difficult conversation or I'll have no conversation and I'll do what I know is right and just and what uh, 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 my uh, inner guide guides me to do. So uh, in closing, I just want to say that I saw this 10 person panel and I'm like, what the hell, how the hell is this gonna go? But I wanna say the two of you are brilliant and you just really work well off of each other and I really enjoy this 10 person panel, so I gotta give it to you. Well, uh, I think what we need to do is uh, a couple of things. Um, one, a quick announcement. As soon as I close out, know that there'll be two book signings. So Susan Burton uh, will be signing a book entitled Becoming Miss Burton from Prison to Recovery to Leading the Fight Against Mass Incarceration. And I'm midway through and it's absolutely um, gripping. Uh, Carol Park, who you heard from earlier today, will also be signing a book, Memoir of a Cashier, Korean Americans, Racism and the Rights. And I think you get a sense of just how poignant a story she has to tell. The final thing I will say before closing out is that Jerry mentioned early on that uh, in the law school we helped to found um, with our colleagues a critical race studies program which uh, Susan um, helped uh, us connect with her work and part of our motto is teach, think and transform and that's not a kind of top down imperative that we articulate but one that we think all of us should engage in with a kind of audacity uh, that Mark um, implored. So thank you all very much for coming and for indulging us this day. Thank you, uh, panelists, for a robust conversation and helping us manage. And one more thing, there will be a reception as well that starts at what time? 5.30. 6.30, okay, got it, thanks. 6.30.